Chorves is a single player space combat the video game. game. Is called Chorus. Wait, what? The game is called Chorus, not Chorves. That's a letter V, isn't it? It's Chorus, okay? Okay, Chorus is a single player space combat video game developed by Fish Labs and published by Deep Silver. The game was released on December 3, 2021 for PC, PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, Xbox One, Xbox Series X and Series S, as well as Stadia and Luna. As of the time of making this video, the demo for this game is only available on PC. This overview will cover the gameplay, the game world, the story, as well as other features. Let's start off with the gameplay. First things first, let's talk about the combat. Chorus is a third-person perspective space combat game where you play as Nara, a gifted pilot with special powers and for most of the game you will be piloting a sentient starship called Forsaken. The ships you use are equipped with three primary weapons, Gatling guns, laser cannons, and missile launchers. Each weapon type is effective for specific types of enemies. The weapons don't utilize an ammunition system but instead the Gatling guns will overheat after prolonged use, which will reduce its rate of fire until you let it cool down. On the other hand, laser cannons will be at its most effective if it is fully charged. Recharging only takes a while as indicated by the meters refilling around the crosshair. The missile launchers are practically the same which will need to reload after continuous firing. When it comes to defensive measures, your ship has a shield and a hull which is basically just your HP. When your shield is down due to an enemy attack or environmental collision, that is when your HP will start to be in danger. Shields regenerate within 5 seconds by default while your HP only regenerates outside of combat. But Chorus is a fast-paced game so your shield and hull can only get you so far when it comes to combat, most especially in higher difficulties. What you will heavily rely on are your evasive maneuvers which come in the form of boosting and dodging attacks. Evasion maneuver successful. Without making use of your trust booster to speed up, you will essentially become an easy target for your enemies. Whereas timing your dodges will come in handy whenever enemies fire certain attacks that will surely hit you if you don't evade it. Dodging can also be used to evade incoming obstacles or enemies. When all else fails though, you can make use of a healing device that will replenish your health fully. You get this early in the game and while useful, its cooldown period takes a long time to recover so you have to be smart when to use it. But what makes Nara and her ship Forsaken stand out from the others is that she uses her special powers called Rites to aid her in battle. In order to avoid spoilers, I will only talk about two rites that were revealed even before the game was released. The first right the game introduces is the right of the census which is basically the game's version of enabling a player to highlight enemies, points of interest, quest markers, and other objects around the game world. This right is particularly helpful in combat to highlight weaknesses in large enemy ships. But more than that, this right allows the player to experience memories left behind by different beings which you can encounter in the world in certain locations. These memories give you a little background story to a mission or an objective you're currently doing. Another example of a right that is useful in combat is the Right of the Hunt, which enables you to teleport behind a targeted enemy and rain death upon them. Each right has a cooldown period and requires varied amounts of right energy that replenishes over time. As you go through the story, you will obtain more rights. And while most of the rights are offensive in nature, some of it can also help you evade harm. But the one ability that is perhaps the most crucial in the game is the Drift Trance, which, as the name suggests, allows you to drift and make sharp turns that you can utilize in different situations such as combat and navigating through narrow enclosed spaces. Besides a few selected people, only Nara can perform the Drift Trance because of her bond with her ship, which allows players to be quick and lethal during combat. Otherwise, without drifting, you will have to cover more ground just to get your enemies back within your crosshair. And while this is viable, it would be inefficient and more time consuming, most especially during missions when there is a time limit. On top of that, it simply isn't recommended since while you are boosting, your turning radius is very limited which makes targeting your enemies harder. Drifting may also be required to do certain maneuvers in certain missions in order to progress further. The game is relatively simple when it comes to player progression and customization. Throughout the main story, there are no other ships you can use besides Forsaken as well as an ordinary ship in the tutorial portion of the game. Occasionally, you will be able to pilot large ships called Spirits, which are basically just big but slow ships with bigger guns, specifically used in portions of the game where there are huge forces to deal with. So for players looking for a variety of ships to use, you will not find it in this game. 
There is also no leveling system via experience points, but instead you improve your ship by purchasing new weapons or acquiring them through missions. The same is true with your hull and shield. However, there is a mastery system in the game which encourages the player to perform certain actions in order to improve your ship's overall stats. Examples of these are using certain weapons or rights to kill your enemies in order to improve their effectiveness. Besides the mastery system and ship upgrades, there are also modification slots that you can equip to improve certain aspects of your ship such as your speed, your damage to shields, or even faster shield regeneration. These modifications can also be purchased. There are also certain missions and side quests throughout the game that will further increase your energy right, which will allow you to perform more rights consecutively. Speaking of missions and side quests, I'll be tackling this in the next portion of the overview, the game world. Missions are divided into story missions and side missions that you can view in the game's menu. These main missions usually start automatically once you are within a certain distance from the quest marker. Side missions, on the other hand, are quests given to you by characters you meet along the way. While some side quests only occur when you approach a point of interest, you may either decide to accept in order to proceed or decline in order to continue on with whatever you are currently doing. Not right now. I see. Both story missions and side missions can be seen all across the map, and some may be in a different location altogether. The game world in Chorus isn't one massive open world star system, but instead you have multiple hub worlds that have these fast travel points called jump gates. These jump gates are basically glorified loading screens that come in the form of hyperspace travel that warps you instantly to another jump gate of your choosing. Besides these jump gates, there are no other fast travel points, which is good or bad depending on the type of player you are. However, when it comes to covering vast distances, you can enable your ship's sublight drive which is a faster way of flying through space than just using your trust booster. But during combat or other objectives within a mission, this feature is usually offline. Besides the sublight drive, there are also these space highways of some sort with gates you can pass through which boosts your travel speed whenever it is available, but it isn't always going to be there for certain locations you're asked to go to. When it comes to exploration and interacting with the world, as you travel through different areas of the map, Nara will have some internal dialogue telling the player a potential point of interest that you can check out. I sense a powerful source close by. Such energy. You may choose to do so or come back for it later. Cultists, there are too many for us. We shall crush them. You may also run into random encounters where you need to fight enemies or aid NPCs that are asking for help to fend off their attackers. Doing so will usually reward you with credits that you can use for purchasing ship upgrades, or they may reward you with ship parts that you can equip yourself. You may equip any ship part you acquire out in the open world anytime through the game menu, or in a designated location called hangars. Speaking of hangars, there are several hangars at different locations that you can land on in order to purchase ship upgrades. And as far as I've seen, these hangars are the only place where you can purchase upgrades and the only indoor facilities you can enter. However, there are ancient temples and indoor locations within land masses and space structures that you can enter, but those are usually done through missions and side quests. But to be clear, for the rest of the game, you can only interact with your environment and talk to NPCs through your ship. So for those wondering whether you can explore the world outside your ship, you will not be able to. Besides cutscenes, you will always be interacting with everything in the game world through your ship, including picking up collectibles and loot out in the open world. It should be noted that each hub world of course has invisible walls, but they are too far out that you probably won't accidentally reach it and trigger the prompt that tells you that you are leaving the playable area. Now that we've talked about the gameplay and the game world, let's talk a little bit about the story. As I've already mentioned, in this game you play as Nara, a gifted pilot with some form of space magic powers troubled by a dark haunting past. Along with her trusted sentient ship called Forsaken, they used to be a formidable weapon who served the Great Prophet, the leader of an oppressive cultist faction called The Circle. After causing so many deaths and seeing the error of her ways, Nara left the circle and went into hiding. Several years later, Nara re-emerges while concealing her true identity, still ridden with immense guilt. Chorus is ultimately a story about redemption, where Nara's journey of self-discovery leads her to figuring out who she really is as a person, while simultaneously learning how to come to terms with her past, not allowing it to define her, but instead accepting accountability for it, as well as moving on to become a stronger and better person. 
Without going into spoiler territory, simply put, Nara seeks her redemption in the form of retribution. And in order to achieve this, Nara is determined to fight against the circle, helping people in need along the way, while gaining allies that will help her put a stop to the Great Prophet's plans that threaten the universe. As far as player choices go and how it affects the ending of the story, it doesn't. There are some side quests that you can choose to do that affects the final mission, but the differences are minimal if not completely negligible. The main story is fairly linear, and so when it comes to story length and how long it will take to beat the game, granted that you do a few side quests and a few random encounters, at medium difficulty you will probably finish the game within 15 hours, even less if you're very fast at defeating enemies. Once you beat the game, there is no new game plus. Instead, you can continue to play from the last save file you have before you reach your final mission, which does warn you of a point of no return. For this segment of the overview, I figured I should mention some noteworthy features and options about the game, namely the permanent death feature which you can also find in some other games. You are given the option to turn on permanent death before you start a new game, and you will not be able to turn it on or off once you begin. You also can't change the difficulty once permanent death is enabled. There are four levels of difficulty, easy, medium, hard, and extreme. If the permanent death feature is disabled, you are allowed to change the difficulty anytime. Another aspect I wanted to mention that may not be important to a lot of people is the number of manual saves you are allowed to make. For someone like me who sometimes wants to load older saves to replay a certain part or to see what could have happened if I did something differently, I prefer to have a lot of manual saves. This game provides you with 7 manual save slots plus 1 slot allotted for an autosave feature. The next thing is also very minor but I thought I should still mention it. Playing with the mouse and keyboard allows you to target within a certain radius, while playing with the controller keeps your crosshair fixed at the center. You can also adjust the aim assist and the auto hit radius if combat becomes too easy for your taste. And last but not least, a photo mode. Yes, like most games these days, this game has a photo mode. But hey, there are some pretty solid backdrops in this game so I can see why it's been included. So yeah, that pretty much sums up this segment. For this portion of the overview, I would like to do some pros and cons regarding the game. Now as you can see with the title, this video isn't exactly a review, and that's because I believe there are already a lot of awesome reviewers out there. So instead what I wanted to do with this video is to give you an idea what to expect with this game, and show you what it had to offer before you go out and buy it. And through the footage I used along with each section of this overview, hopefully you can more or less determine if this is the type of game that you would consider playing. With that said, maybe you're still undecided, so hopefully this pros and cons segment could help in that regard, because at the end of the day, only you you can know for certain what games are for you. So for my pros and cons, my criteria are relatively simple. Is it fun? Is it immersive? Is the story good? Are the graphics pleasant enough? Are the sounds done well? Is the game performance acceptable? How about replayability? So is the game fun? This easily goes to the pros column. I do however have some gripes when it comes to the consistency of the game's difficulty, and so far with what I've seen through other people's reviews, the difficulty spikes are not something that only I notice. One moment things are going smoothly and then in another moment you're in a boss battle and you're like, what the hell just happened? You then retry without changing anything with your strategy and you somehow succeed. There are several moments when you might feel this way, but maybe we're in the minority, I don't know. But when even the game developers had to make some things easier in a small update, then it's quite possible that there are more that might have slipped through the cracks. Overall though, I enjoyed my time with the space battles itself true and true up until the end of the game. The variety of enemies and situations you put in and the arsenal available to you to deal with them was a really engaging experience, and definitely makes you feel empowered as a player, that is when things were going smoothly. I will say that for the most part, I found myself dying or failing a mission more due to collisions than the enemies themselves. But your mileage may vary. Is the game immersive? The game is aesthetically beautiful, and so this is definitely one of the pros of the game, because even if I were just traveling from one point to another and nothing was happening, I didn't mind it that much because the feeling of just flying through space was done so well. During moments in the game when you're being chased, I most certainly felt the urgency of running for your life. Furthermore, the environments in the hub worlds are different enough from each other to make you feel that you're in a completely different part of the galaxy, which definitely lends itself to immersion. 
However, besides ancient temples and such, I wish there were actual planets to explore because the environments were mostly desolate, filled with asteroids, debris, and other land masses that aren't exactly planets, and space stations which I guess are all justified by the story. But more variations to locations you can land on and explore could have definitely helped, but for what is actually there, I think the game is immersive enough. Moving on, is the story good? Unfortunately, this will have to be my first con for the game. Now, I'm someone who really values the story in games, so a story that isn't too good is a deal breaker for me. However, Chorus might be one of the rare exceptions for me. I enjoyed my time way too much in the game that even the somewhat disjointed story wasn't enough to turn me off. So in a way, it's a great thing that the space battles were a lot of fun. Now, this game is a new IP, so there are some aspects of the plot and its lore that may get confusing, and so that I sort of understood. However, my main issue is, there are story moments in the game that could have spent more time in the oven, but because it wasn't developed all that well, the outcomes felt a bit rushed and unearned, and some moments were just straight up cheesy and just could have been delivered a bit better. Also, one of the glaring things is there were almost no other characters to be invested in besides Nara and her ship the Forsaken. Overall, the story has some redeeming value though because I believe there is a somewhat profound message at the end of the game, specifically the concluding monologue, but I just feel like it could have been executed better for sure. On to the graphics, is it pleasant enough? As I've said with the immersion factor, the game is aesthetically beautiful. I like the ship designs and overall art design. The character animation of Nara and the quality of the cutscenes weren't mind-blowing but they served their purpose. Graphically speaking, it's not aged or outdated. And if I'm not mistaken, this is a relatively small budget game, at least in comparison to AAA games. And so overall, I find the graphics to be pretty solid. When it comes to sound, I'll still put it in the pros column because I found the sound effects during combat to be done very well. The damage feedback and the indicators of when you're about to be hit was sufficient. And part of my enjoyment of the combat is the satisfying sounds the weapons make and whenever you destroy enemies. As for voice acting, it was okay. None of the characters were cringy to listen to which is good. When it comes to music however, none of it really stands out. It's just sort of there, if that makes sense. As for the game's performance, I guess this will depend on what platform you play this on, but I only got to play this game on the PC so that's the only thing I can comment on. With an i7 and a 1080 Ti, the game ran smoothly at the highest settings all throughout in 1440p resolution at 60 frames per second, no crashes or any major hiccup. There were only rare frame drops during the beginning of a cutscene or during it, but gameplay wise, there were barely any kind of drastic frame drops even when there were numerous enemies or effects on screen. When it comes to how polished the game is, I didn't experience any game breaking bugs that prevented you from progressing through the game. I never had to reload or retry a mission because a bug occurred. However, I did occasionally experience a highlighted path disappear on me during some of the missions, which made me confused on where to go next. But overall, it didn't happen often enough to really disrupt my playthrough. Now, what about replayability? I guess I will have to put this right in the middle. I had a lot of fun with the game and because of that, this is probably one of those games that I will revisit just to pass time and maybe even try my best with the permanent death feature. But besides my lack of investment in the story, unless you're a completionist, in my opinion, I can't really rate the replayability of this game highly and I will probably only play this game all over again just to discover whatever secrets I haven't unfolded yet and perhaps get a better grasp of the story. Alright, so that is it for this game overview. If this video was informative or helped you in any kind of way, consider subscribing. Maybe leave a thumbs up and hit that bell icon as well so that you get notified whenever I post new videos. I will do my best to cover at least one new game per month based on the game's release date in order to stay true to the channel's name of wandering through the world of video games. Whether it's a big AAA title, or a relatively smaller game like Chorus, or to be honest just any game that I find interesting, I will be creating another game overview of it. So once again, if you'd like to, subscribe, like, share, leave a comment, you know the drill. It will help the channel a lot and as always, thank you all for watching and I will see you all in the next one.